Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Non-Toxic Environments. This is Andy Pace, your host. I am very, very happy to be with you all again today. We have another exciting episode and uh, deals with the issue of moisture levels, humidity, mold, all those fun things. But more importantly, how we avoid these things in our homes. Uh, it's something that I've talked about on the show and in my consult consulting for uh, many years now, which is just about every home I'm involved with around the country, I am uh, recommending whole house dehumidification. I don't care where you live. If you're in, in um, Phoenix or if you're in, in New England area, you, you have to have it for, for different reasons. So um, I want to talk about that today. And we thought best expert to talk about in the country is uh, Nikki Krieger from Santa Fe Dehumidifiers. And, you know, I, I follow, I've been following Nikki on, on LinkedIn and other social media for uh, a couple of years now. And I just absolutely love everything she talks about. And I, I just think you're going to enjoy it as well. So Nikki, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for inviting me. I'm looking forward to this. You are welcome. So I asked this for everybody, how in the world did you get involved in dehumidification? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it is interesting because my background is marketing and public relations and um when i came to work at thermostore uh for the marketing and, and at the time it was ultra air yes. whole house ventilating dehumidifiers mm -hmm. and then santa fe was the crawl space and basement and so i handled the marketing for the residential and part of my uh learning curve about dehumidification and ventilation in homes is is really diving deep mm -hmm. and what are builders dealing with what are homeowners what are mechanical designers hvac so i started taking some aca courses i became a, a hers rater so i could understand you know how does the infiltration and blower doors and duct blasters and all that work and the more i started to learn so i could speak intelligently and market about it um it's a rabbit hole. You you just start going down and realizing, especially, you know, crawl spaces is, you know, kind of its own beast. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the entire home and all the building science that you need to kind of understand and what climate zone you're in, um, it, you, you need to know so much, so much. And so, I, I just kept going. And I was very thankful that Todd DeMont, who was president at the time of Thermostore, which is the company in Madison, Wisconsin, that um, manufactures these dehumidifiers, said, have at it. If you find something that you are interested in and a course you want to take, you know, go ahead. We support you. So I was very, very lucky that way. And that's just how it came about. And Ken Gehring, who's the gentleman um, that was one of the inventors of these dehumidifiers, um, who's, I think he's 84, 85 now, um, still involved. And he really took the time to educate and, and, and me on everything that I, all the questions, because to some people, they probably made a lot of sense. Like, why are you even asking that? That's common sense. To me, I was like, it's not. <laughs> I need to know more. And uh, and what I learned from him is, you know, it's a lot of times just adding a dehumidifier is not the answer. And we've got to look at the entire uh, picture and understand more. So. Boy, and you, 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 you said a lot right there in that very last sentence. You've got to look at the entire picture because I can't tell you how many projects I've been into where, and I mentioned it before. Yes, I use dehumidification every project I do. But it's not just as simple as that. It's it's how was it incorporated into the entire HVAC system? How is it used within the living space? Um, I had a project recently in Florida that, it, you know, 5,000 square foot home outside of Miami, and they had um, found elevated mold counts in the house and um, also elevated VOCs. So the consultant that they're working with originally said, well, you need fresh air intakes. You got to get rid of that those VOCs. Well, then somebody had the idea, the bright idea, which I, I thought was good. But if you're bringing in fresh air, you also have to dehumidify. Okay, again, on paper, that makes sense. How they did it did not make sense. 
you know, they put in dehumidification on a separate ductwork system from the fresh air intake, and it just couldn't keep up. It, it couldn't keep up. It didn't. It didn't um, take care of circulating that dehumidified air, and so it has everything to do with making sure that that you know that schematic let's call it is is drawn out properly because if you if your your equipment gets put in the wrong place at the wrong time it could do more damage absolutely i uh, had a call a couple years ago from a contractor that was irate he was so upset um i installed your dehumidifier um, in a customer's home 2 weeks ago and the humidity has actually gone up in the home and so my first question was, how'd you install it? And so once we worked through that and understanding that he put it on the return side of the HVAC system, which when we do that, you know, we potentially then we, well, we heat up the coils of the air conditioner. So when the air conditioner is running, it's not gonna remove as much water okay. because when you dehumidify as a byproduct, you generate heat. Mm. Um, and so the logical thing is, well, if I'm going to generate heat, I'm going to put it before the air conditioner. So then it gets treated mm -hmm. and cooled before it gets delivered to the rest of the home. But the challenge with that is that heat's going to heat up those coils on that AC system. And those coils have to be able to hit dew point in order for water to condense and actually go down the drain. And when you put that heat there, that'll prevent that. Then also when the air conditioner shuts off, all the water that's on those coils can get re-evaporated back into the house when the dehumidifier comes on. And that's what was happening. We were, we were basically humidifying the air um, the way that that was set up. And so I had the contractor go back out, change it, tie it into the supply side of the HVAC system, and then it ended up working out. And it actually in Florida, there's only two ways per code now you can install a dehumidifier. Okay. So, and they're catching on to that. And one of that, it, you know, you can't go in on the return side anymore in okay. Florida per code. Um, that's good. Yeah, and that's because Florida Solar Energy did a study that basically identified that it was the most ineffective and inefficient way to install a dehumidifier. Oh. That's very good information. That's I just learned something right now because you know typically I see dehumidification, you know, uh, fresh air intake, dehumidification, purification, then it goes in the blower. And I, for me, I like that because a purification system works more efficiently. Like one that has a lot of carbon, carbon fills yeah. up faster when there's moisture present. So a drier air makes it more efficient, but then in your scenario so do, would is that something you would do all across the country then or just more in those states where you're you're cooling more than heating i would do it everywhere um just because what's going to really matter i mean first of all we see that we've had summers where we've got you know temperatures that are higher um, in parts of the country we usually don't experience that right sure. so when we're seeing it for longer periods of time Plus, you don't know how long that air conditioner is really running because we you might not know what the infiltration is or how leaky that house is. Right. So and, you know, then you get shorter run times potentially, but we really need that air conditioner to remove as much water as possible when it is running. When, you know, when we do designs of mechanical systems, we're we're sizing that equipment based on how much water it can remove also when it is running. You have your sensible, which is the temperature we feel. We have the latent, which is the moisture in the air. And they're trying to size equipment based on those numbers from their manual J's that they're hopefully running. Mm -hmm. um, but if we 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 want the air conditioner to remove as much water as possible when it's running. Um, Ken Gearing, He's on, uh, the gentleman who I said earlier that invented these, he's on a forum called HVAC Talk. Mm -hmm. And that's where he spends his time. And I think the last time I looked, he had about 12,000 posts. Um, he's known as Teddy Bear on there. <laughs> and I mean, people seek him out in all industries and homeowners who are at their wits end looking for somebody to help them. Um, seek him out because he'll be the first to say, 
it's not going to fix it. But one of the posts that he had is basically AC is king and dehumidification is queen. So when the AC is running, we want it to remove as much water as possible. It's when the king is sleeping that the the dehumidifier comes on and, and does the work, which is shoulder, you know, Wisconsin, shoulder seasons, right? overnight times, um, when maybe we're not running as much air conditioning, but we never want our coils on our AC to be warm. Okay. You know, because so, that's going to reduce the effectiveness. Right. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. So in, in um, a perfect world, yep. if somebody wanted to incorporate the use of a uh, heat recovery ventilator or energy recovery ventilator, mm -hmm. air purification, dehumidification, humidification, like in Wisconsin and yeah. you know, Minnesota where it just gets so dry in the wintertime, what, what would be your um your schematic how would you line that up well we get a lot of inquiries on trying to incorporate ervs and dehumidifiers together right um because an erv will lessen the load right right but it still is it's it's humidifying less is is the best way to put it it's always going to add to the moisture load in the humid season right. but uh the 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 ideal for those two then is let the RV have the ERV with its duct work, um, because that's really how they're supposed to be installed, right? With their own duct work. Okay. And then have the dehumidifier not do ventilation, but just focus on the dehumidification of the home. You know, okay. a humidifier and a dehumidifier ideally are not running at the same times. I mean, being from okay. Wisconsin, I never would live in a house without a whole house humidifier. I mean, mm -hmm. my house, when I lived there, was an 1870s home that had been redone. And I couldn't pump enough humidity <laughs> into that house. Uh, but, and then, you know, your filtration is, you know, for, for our dehumidifiers, we have MERV 13 filtration on them. Um, because if you do use it for ventilation, you do want to make sure that you're getting effective filtration and then plus when it runs but you know your filtration is going to have to be based on you know an expert telling you what you should be adding there mm -hmm. um, based on what the needs are in your home okay so um breaking that down a little bit you're saying that your recovery ventilator whether it's a, just a heat recovery ventilator or energy recovery ventilator would be in its own ducted system that's what they recommend in most of the manuals for them now does that always happen Probably not, but right. that's what's recommended. Um, but, you know, keeping them separate from the dehumidifier, you know, an ERV or an HRV and a dehumidifier both have their own fans. And then you've got an HVAC system with a fan. Right. So that mechanical contractor has to look at this system and say, okay, I have all these fans. We can't be pulling and pushing against each other because of static. Right. And so that can start causing some some issues. So a colleague of mine, David Trelevin, wrote an article um, in Green Building Advisor mm -hmm. um, on different ways to integrate, you know, HRVs and ERVs and dehumidifiers together, um, pros and cons of all of them. And basically it comes down to the best choice is just to keep them separated. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and that is difficult because is. most of the systems that are on the market are designed to sort of incorporate right into the return air plenum. Um, I mean, there are systems like the Zender units that, you know, it, it, if you see one of those Zender systems, it's yeah. like, you know, spaghetti noodles up in it your is. attic, it but is. highly effective. Highly effective. And, you know, if your ERV is going in on the return side, um, and your dehumidifier is pulling a dedicated return, if possible, mm -hmm. and going in on the supply side of the HVAC system, there shouldn't be any issues Okay. that way. Because um, we're going in, you know, uh, uh, after the air has been treated mm -hmm. on that supply, that supply side. Got it. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot to learn in this. And I think that, um, you know, I, I find that HVAC contractors, you know, they're not, they're not scientists. Most of them, some are, but most of them are not scientists, especially the ones who are doing the work in your house. Mm -hmm. They are laborers. They do a good job. They do, you know, they know what they're doing from their end of installing equipment, but they're not there to 
um, turn your indoor air quality into a science. Yeah. And that's what, why you have to sometimes involve a mechanical engineer uh, or somebody who is specific to IEQ uh, and creating these, you know, schematics for how this is all supposed to be put together. Absolutely. And, you know, the construction industry is changing very quickly. HVAC equipment is changing very quickly. We've got building codes. We've got green building standard programs. There is there's a lot coming at these HVAC contractors to have to learn and try to understand. Um, but I would always advocate for if if someone's working on my house, having a someone who understands home performance. I, you know, I would like a blower door because mm -hmm. the reality is, is no matter what systems you put in, if you have a large amount of leakage that's taking place in your home, you can't control your environment. And you need to know what you're dealing with um, and, and, and try to, you know, air seal as much as possible. That's the only way you're going to be able to control your environment with filtration, dehumidification, humidification, all that is if you can try to, you know, close up your house as much as possible. And, you know, I hear all the time that, you know, well, you know, the reason that we're having all these problems is because houses are too tight. <laughs> you know, and, and and that's not the case because really what we're doing is we're tightening it up so we can control the environment as much as possible. Right. And you're exactly right. Um, that old adage of, well, a house needs to breathe. Yeah. Well, no, the occupants of the home need to breathe. The house could care less. But if you want to reduce um, moisture related issues, then you have to seal up everything tight. I would rather have somebody live in a in a concrete box with no air leakage whatsoever, but then you can control when and where that air and moisture comes in. Yes. Uh, but it's it's a hard thing to to, uh, to convince somebody, and especially in the in the industry. You know, builders have been in this mindset for so many years now of how how they have to do things. In in the age of green building high performance building. Uh, I think this is where we ran into so many problems is because they made the homes tighter and tighter energy efficient wise, but not tight enough. So um, if it's really tight, but still allowed for some air leakage, this is where we have problems. Yeah. Um, because now once moisture gets in, there's no good way to get it out. And you run into a mold problem in your exterior cavity wall. So uh, I've I've advocated for things like insulated concrete form construction uh, for 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 well two decades now because I think that's the absolute best way to build. However, the industry just um, doesn't want to go that way. I think it's just it's still in infancy stage because of cost and availability of of um, skilled labor to do the work and whatnot. Yeah. And so you mentioned something before air sealing, and this is what I've been pushing with clients in the last several years now is, you know, get away from doing spray foam insulation because spray foam is toxic, but do something like a blown in blanket system, but make sure you do your air sealing of all those cavity walls first, because if any moisture gets in from the outside, any air comes in, moisture will come with it. And that's when we run into problems. Um, do you see a, a shift, uh, especially down South, uh, away from, and I'm hoping you do because I, 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 I'll be honest, I don't see the shift yet. But getting HVAC systems out of attics and out of crawl spaces, I so I haven't seen the shift down south. Now, uh, the state of Washington is incentivizing builders to put mechanical systems in uh, conditioned spaces. Yay. So, I mean, where we had never seen encapsulated crawl spaces before, because in all honesty, the the dew points are fairly low in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. People don't think that. They're like, well, it rains all the time. Yeah. Um, but dew points are fairly low. So encapsulating crawl spaces um, isn't a norm. You get into the pockets mm -hmm. where, you know, people will do it, but it hasn't been the norm. But now we're seeing that those spaces are being encapsulated up there because they are being sensitized to put their mechanicals in. And it should be. To me, 
you know, we're, we have this massive push right now to go to heat pumps because yeah. of energy efficiency and in all these man, I mean, we're seeing that, you know, we've got to change all of our refrigeration and our dehumidifiers by the beginning of 2025. HVAC, so there, all of these environmental and energy efficient pushes, but yet we're still allowing HVAC systems to be in 140, 160 degree attics in Texas. It, it, and it, it just, it that doesn't make sense to me. That, to me, that's kind of like the low hanging fruit that we should right. be incentivizing and going after. Right. And I, and I, I, I'm, I get so frustrated because then it's my job as a consultant to try to fix the problems that were created only because the, 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 the building industry in those, in that area says, well, that's just the way we do things. Yeah. Well, and, that's not a good excuse to do anything. No. no. And I, I mean, when I was I was telling you earlier that I was listening to Ash and Sam's interview this earlier today, and they were talking about their crawl space, which I, I've encapsulated crawl spaces. Mm -hmm. um, I worked with Advanced Energy out of North Carolina and another um, restoration contractor out of Georgia. We have a two day building and science crawl space encapsulation class. Um, I I don't think vented crawl spaces should be allowed anymore given what we know right. i have never been in one that's been like yep it's okay to hang out down here and, and you know 50 percent, up to 50 percent of the air in your living space comes from your crawl space and that is the foundation of your home mm -hmm. that is to me one of the most important areas it's it's you know your your greatest asset is sitting on top of that and um, yeah, crawl spaces sh should not be vented. Um, it, it, and it's it's sad because there are so many calls that we get from people that are absolutely devastated that, you know, someone's been in their crawl space and told them they have to encapsulate it now. And the amount of damage that's been done, not only already to them health wise, but, you know, to to their home. To the home itself exactly yes. and then turns into a much bigger mess and and so i find that the more i talk to people all around the country and especially those on crawl space and i would rather have somebody have a, have a home with a basement because i i can deal with that a little bit easier right and now now we have to get the the architectural designers and the in the builders to incorporate true waterproofing technology uh, into the foundation and not just spraying on damp proofing, which is nothing more than, you know, asphalt cutback that breaks down in six months. Yeah. Um, so again, changing the mentality, but it, it's a process. I, I, um, I can't imagine what you have to go through every day talking. If you're talking with contractors across the country, having to like reinvent the wheel for them, uh, it must be a little bit frustrating. Hey, what, what we all need to focus. And I, I, spoke at the International Builders Show last year on vented uh, versus unvented crawl spaces and tremendous amount of, of interest from production builders mm. that, you know, in, in some of them were actually uh, encapsulating their crawl spaces. But then, you know, there's there's four different ways in code that you can qualify for conditioning that space. And the most common is using supply air from the HVAC system mm -hmm. in order to put some cold, drier air into a cool space already based on AC runtime in the living space. And you, by code, you have to have a transfer grow. Mm -hmm. So that air has to be communicating with the house. And I... I think about that and, you know, especially in the South and the Southeast where they're spraying for termites yeah. and then you've got pressure treated wood and you've got all, I, I don't want to share any air no. with my home at all. And I, I, again, I think our, our building codes are not keeping up with all this other things that, you know, mechanical systems that are getting so energy efficient at, you know, not running a lot, how tight our houses are that you're not getting the runtime on that AC system, first of all, in order to keep the crawl space dry. It, right. it, it doesn't make sense. But we should not be sharing air at all. You know, 
put it, make a basement if possible. But I understand in lots of parts of the country, that's not, you know, due right. to water table and that sort of thing. But, you know, when I look at a, a vented crawl space and I see those vents and I'm like, air doesn't come in one side and then automatically just go out the <laughs> other side. No. You know, based on thermodynamics, it's coming in and going up and we got water pipes that are condensing and we've got leaky duct work down there. Mm. Um, and, and then you've got an HVAC system, which is one of the most expensive systems in your house, rotting mm -hmm. in those spaces. Because if you look at them, they're almost always rusty. They've always. been condensing, yeah. yes. And and then they have someone has to crawl in there and actually maintain it. Yeah, yeah, so, it's a it's a nightmare, it really it is. is. And, and so I, you know, I'd rather have them do than just a slab on grade. I would uh, slab on grade or do a rat slab, right. in you know, like a mini basement. Um, if we can't go, but I, and we are, you know, this numbers that we are seeing, um on on you know foundations that are being used in construction slab on grade is 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 growing quickly because it is less expensive and less problems to go up than mm -hmm. it is to go down that's for sure that's for sure now in in a slab on grade situation then we have to talk about well like in texas every every home built in texas slab on grade has their um hvac system up in the attic and so now we deal with, as you mentioned before, 140, 150 degree uh, Texas air that's up in the attic. And so two ways to deal with that is the, well, the first one is to uh, build out a closet somewhere in the conditions floor area where you can put your HVAC system. The other way is to completely encapsulate and condition the attic space. And now you're talking a, a, a $60,000 upgrade in a house. However, you gain a lot of storage area uh, and you have, it's a lot nicer for a, a contractor to be walking up into an attic to deal with some issues up there, changing out filters when, you know, you don't have to wipe the sweat away from your eyes. And so yeah. you know, there's just so many benefits to, to doing this, but it's again, change in mentality. This is the the, the difficult part. I, it, it, it Getting architects, builders, and um, homeowners to accept that they need a room in their condition space in their house for their comfort health control center for their home um, is hard. They don't want to give up any of that floor space, yeah. but that's where we need to get. We need to get to the point where um, it's acceptable to have a room that, you know, it becomes part of your laundry room or whatever it is, but that's where we want to be able to maintain the system that is, is helping our, you know, helping us breathe and keeping us comfortable. Yeah, and I have to deal with clients who are not only is worried about mold uh, situations, but also chemical situations. Yeah. And so uh, I also have to remind them that if your if your HVAC system is down in the in the, uh, the the crawl space or up in an attic, and and maybe it's an existing home that you purchased and you don't know what it's sucking in, chemically wise, because every HVAC system out there is going to have little cracks and crevices and areas that air can get in, and if air can get in, it can bring in contaminants. If you're dealing with the crawl space, you had mentioned before, you know, spraying for termites and and so forth. Well, if the home was built on a on an old farm field, you know, the pesticides used in farming can linger in the soil for 50, 60 years. And yeah. so just imagine that getting into the into the house. So to your point before, you don't want to share that that air. No. No. Well, and you know, when you talk about these chemicals or, you know, VOCs, mm -hmm. volatile organic compounds. You know, what's interesting to me um, and what I didn't know much about, but learned is, have you ever heard of the Chinese drywall mm -hmm. that was going on yes. where they were having the formicary corrosion and they figured yep. out that it came from China and um, they saw abundance of it in Florida. And then it, it was the off gassing from this drywall mm -hmm. that was causing these problems. And what they figured out is that if you... Uh, minimize the humidity that it would off gas less. less. Yes. Now that doesn't, you know, as a mother of a daughter who has asthma, that doesn't matter to me less. I don't want any, 
I don't <laughs> less is not okay. I don't right. want any, but they also know that that drywall made it farther north and they couldn't find it. Yeah. And so humidity has a, a huge impact on the off gassing of every product that our house, you know, potentially is built with or that we bring into our home. And the higher the relative humidity, the higher levels and quicker that these products are going to off gas. Formaldehyde, you know, mm -hmm. is a is a big one. And ventilation doesn't necessarily take care of formaldehyde because it's a little heavier in the air. Mm -hmm. So controlling that relative humidity will help minimize. I mean, obviously, first and foremost is source control, right? Don't bring it in. Right. If at all. But that's not even realistic right. anymore. Wood naturally is going to have you know, mm -hmm. off gassing in it and mm -hmm. or formaldehyde. So, um, but controlling the relative humidity has so many benefits. Um, and, and whether that is, you know, adding some in the winter time or making sure that we, from a health standpoint, don't go above that 50% mm -hmm. um, in the humid season. So we got spring, summer, and fall. And, you know, I, I worked with a, a customer where, for years, she suffered from Lyme's disease and they didn't realize that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And her doctor told her that she her home had to be at 45% relative humidity all the time. Otherwise, she would get flare-ups. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, why we say 50, because that's where the Sterling chart shows us that we want to keep um, from all these different health things. But, you know, some people might even be more sensitive that have to keep it a little bit lower and consistently lower. So once you fix the problem, you know, I mean, if we've got a leak, we've got a problem that needs to be fixed and then you have restor you know, a, a restoration done and remediation, then we've got to maintain it. And that's really where, you know, these dehumidifiers come in is not necessarily fixing the problem, but once it is fixed, then we help maintain it from there out. So for everybody who listens to the show regularly or knows me and, and what I've talked about over the years, uh, Nikki, you just said something that I've been saying for many years, and I promise everybody listening, I did not like send Nikki a gift card or pay her for saying this because I think I've been one of the only people in the country talking about this. And it, it's, I am so happy you just said it. Elevated humidity causes elevated off gassing. Now I can't tell you the exact um, scientific answer from what I've seen in my own testing is that as humidity comes from a surface humidity also carries with it the chemical footprint of where it was. And so, uh, and I proved this many years ago, um, I do a, a very specific formaldehyde release test called a FRAT test. A FRAT test measures passive emissivity from surfaces of formaldehyde only. And I had a client who was complaining of, of breathing issues in her home. And I went down to the home and I tested everything in the house and found that the carpeting that was 28 years old was still off-gassing toxic levels of formaldehyde. Now, this is not unheard of. This is not new information. Um, a, uh, um, a scientist, uh, Dr. Rosalind Anderson, years ago, studied carpeting ranging anywhere from new to 20 years old that's, that found out that carpet can off-gas formaldehyde at um, toxic levels uh, just because of um, warmth on the carpet, lights, uh, light coming through a window can heat up carpet enough, just the ambient temperature. And she found that it could off gas enough to kill laboratory rats. Oh my God. So since then I've been on this bandwagon and I, I've, I've, I got this test system that we, we, uh, were able to get, uh, out of Japan. And, um, so in doing this test found how high the, uh, the formaldehyde level was. I also, um, found out that she kept the windows open for fresh air ventilation, kind of hearkening back to what we talked about earlier, right? With um, with humidity levels and, and fresh air, um, the humidity level in her house was probably 55, 60%. So I told her to, and this is kind of before I developed my working theory of off-gassing levels and humidity. I told her to close up the windows 
uh, turn on the air, uh, add a, a portable dehumidifier if she had one, and I'll come back in two weeks and I'll retest the carpet. And I did that, and the and the off gassing was seventy five percent lower. Wow. Yes. That's impressive. Just from reducing the moisture in the air, thus reducing the moisture that gets into the surface and and re yeah. releases. And so um, this is the the sort of the working theory that I've been going with now for several years, which is higher humidity leads to increased off gassing. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, thank you for saying that because I, I, I don't know if that's really um, discussed at all at professional levels. I, I don't hear it very often. Um, and the presentations that I do focusing on health, um, I always include that. And, and again, I, I always give that Chinese drywall example yep. because I mean that was the extreme yep. but that's the reality of you know and, and then once you think about it and you look at you know your couch and your cabinets and your Ikea furniture and all that stuff that you're bringing in it's all made it you know of, of at least the glues if nothing mm -hmm. else has chemicals in it exactly um and so it, it will I I think we have so many sensitivities now that we often don't know what they're from you know, everybody's first thought is mold. Mm -hmm. well, that that might not be the case. I mean, Correct. mold is natural in our environment. We know that. Um, but there are ones that are going to affect us more. And some people are more sensitive to a smaller amount. But I think it's the VOCs. Just, you know, you also take a, it, it's no different than if you're eating processed food all the time. Mm -hmm. It's chemicals. And so it, you know, inside and out, we're getting it. Well, it's it's about that whole chemical soup that we develop in our homes, uh, and we have to talk about the whole picture because it, it's how the home was built, how it's maintained, and then the clothing we wear, the shampoo and and you know body washes that we use, the food that we eat, all of this stuff can combine. And for most people, seventy five percent of the world, it really doesn't um, acutely affect them. It may affect them long term, but they don't have any effects right now yep. for 25 percent of the population they do and what we have to pinpoint down to is what's the trigger well yeah one of the things we talked about extensively formaldehyde understand that and this is for everybody listening others understand that formaldehyde is not treated as a voc when manufacturers give you their voc ratings formaldehyde is a different test and so when when a, uh, a a zero VOC paint comes out, no VOCs, but when it's tested after it's applied and it's off-gassing formaldehyde, they'll say, but it can't. It's got zero VOCs. Well, no. First of all, uh, formaldehyde is not part of the EPA test method 24, uh, number one. Number two, that material is tested in the can. It's not tested as it's curing or cured on the surface. So manufacturers have been able to incorporate are called formaldehyde precursors that will actually create formaldehyde during the curing process to get around the regulations. This happens on a lot of materials. Um, you also have to remember that if you're looking at a, a safety data sheet of a product to give you any indication of health and safety, it will not. Um, safety data sheets were developed specifically for first responders and hazard cleanup crews to make sure they're protected properly if there's a spill or a fire. Inside of your home, that SDS is not going to tell you a thing. So you have to really trust your sources of this information. Um, and you also have to remember that just because something is said zero or low doesn't necessarily mean in your home it's going to be that way. And then obviously, it's you have to take this holistic approach. It is utilizing healthier materials, obviously eating as best as we can, uh, but air purification, uh, proper, I don't even, even want to say dehumidification, but proper humidity control. Yep. Both ways. Both right? ways. Uh, and so all of this needs to be incorporated. And now this sounds like a just a real pain in the butt for contractors, right? Um, and so when I have homeowners around the country who are building houses and they, they'll they have me work with the contractor to make sure that things are done correctly for their types of sensitivities, you know, quite often the contractor just throws up his hands and says, I, I can't do this. This is, there's way too much involved here. So we're trying to make it 
a little simpler for people. Um, and we talk about these topics quite extensively, but it really comes down to common sense, doesn't it? Common sense and 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 just educating yourself. I mean, unfortunately, the way that we've approached a lot of these things is no good deed goes unpunished, right? We want to mm -hmm. be energy efficient. Yep. Um, and then we're energy efficient and then we create homes that, you know, can make people sick. And so it's the unintended consequence of is. trying to do the right thing. It is. And, and trying to look at everything um, that you have to think about for, I mean, because everybody's different too. You just never know what's going to affect someone. You know, it's, it's one of the things that you got to look at it as a, at a larger scale and try to just start working layer through layer through layer. But understanding each change you make um, is going to have a ripple effect and affect something else. You know, during um, the, the 2009 recession, when um, people weren't selling homes or buying new homes, but then people started to invest in, in, in the homes they were living in. And one of them that we saw was starting to do the, the upgrade of air sealing and insulation and, you know, a lot of spray foam that was going into new construction now was being applied into renovations without the understanding that as soon as we change the envelope of that home, that HVAC system that was already oversized mm -hmm. now is going to be, you know, at least double oversized, if not more. And that's when we started getting a lot of phone calls from, from people, you know, saying, well, I got, you know, this is what I did to my home. And well, did this, the insulation contractor work with the HVAC contractor to understand that system. Well, no, nobody, th those, those trades weren't speaking to each other. And that's what we need. We need the trades working more together to understand what's going on. You know, I had people like, oh, you know, we had this new insul you know, insulation put in and I think it's the insulation that smells. And I'm like, well, your house, you know, it's, it's probably the house that actually smells, but now you're trapping everything inside. You don't have ventilation mm -hmm. going on. You know, that cat pee smell uh, could have mm -hmm. always been there, but <laughs> you were leaky enough that you just didn't notice it. But, you know, ventilation is very important. And a lot of talk about how we're going to ventilate and how much we're going to ventilate. And again, it all depends on the person you you don't know how much ventilation um and and all of these things are minimum recommendations and that's how we need to look at it but then they're like oh the energy that it's going to cost to treat that air well if you can't live in the house it doesn't matter right it doesn't matter so we need to you know when i talk to builders you know you build a really tight envelope you bring in mechanical ventilation you size the system accordingly Oh, and by the way, now you're going to have to add a dehumidifier. And it used to be you said dehumidifier and fingers pointed. Somebody did something wrong if I got to add a dehumidifier. Well, the reality is if you're doing everything right now and you need a dehum dehumidifier, it's that's it. You did it. You did it right. Now you have the most detrimental thing to our home and our health, which is moisture, you actually have a system that's going to control that specifically to a specific RH. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, when you have 50, 50, 55 percent relative humidity, you will feel more comfortable at a warmer temperature. So you can actually increase that thermostat two to three degrees and be just as comfortable without trying to overcool to remove moisture. And overcooling is where we start seeing a lot of additional problems, right? We get that ductwork really cold. We start getting condensation. We've got it, you know, potentially in our walls. Um, so overcooling to dehumidify is not going to be an effective strategy. Oh, what fantastic information. Nikki, you've been very, very generous with your time and your knowledge. I want to leave some time uh, in case anybody has any questions, but I also want to have you talk about your company and your products because, um, a lot of people who are listening are either going to be building new or remodeling. And so tell us a little bit about the, the equipment that you provide and, you know, anything new that's on that uh, you've come up with that you want to share. 
Sure. So um, Santa Fe dehumidifiers, we do whole house ventilating dehumidifiers. So those actually integrate with the HVAC system. You can bring in outdoor supply air. Um, so we're putting, you know, a slight positive pressure, which in mixed humid, humid climates is, is a good idea trying to stop that infiltration from the outside. Um, and then we dehumidify the entire home, uh, regardless of the air conditioner runtime. So we're going to set that dehumidifier to 50%. And when it gets above 50% relative humidity, relative humidity in the house, the dehumidifier is going to come on and dehumidify the entire home. And then we also uh, manufacture basement and crawl space dehumidifiers. So we actually invented whole house ventilating dehumidifiers in the 90s and actually um, were the first to market for the horizontal crawl space dehumidifiers um, back in the mid 90s as well. We're headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the gentlemen um, that, that still is very active in uh, educating online for us is Ken Gehring, and he was pivotal in, in inventing these products. And, I, you know, what's really interesting to me is, again, this was the mid-90s. We were talking someone inventing a whole house ventilating dehumidifier. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're become, coming to a time in our construction practices and in our homes where I think we're going to start seeing dehumidifiers as more standard um, because of how tight we're building and energy efficient and how energy efficient our HVAC equipment is. So it's really neat for me to see someone who helped invent something actually seeing it become more mainstream of a product. Mm -hmm. um, and what's great about that is now we're seeing contractors adopt it more often too, because it's familiar, right? When we start doing things that are unfamiliar, they, like you said, the contractors throws their hands up and says, I, I don't know what to do here. This is, this is too much. But as it becomes more mainstream, um, then we get their comfort levels and we see them installed correctly. And so, yeah, it's, it's very exciting um, to work for a company that is, you know, with our products being manufactured in, in Madison, mm -hmm. um, engineered there and, uh, and the growth that we're seeing. Thank you for that. I, I, I want to touch on um, two more quick topics before we're done today, because I know these are topics of interest to a lot of our listeners. First one is uh, a home that's multiple story or maybe has multiple uh, HVAC systems. Do you recommend a dehumidification system on each unit or what would your recommendation be there? So usually if someone calls me and says, you know, ask me this question, I usually come back with a lot of questions because I right. want to know how, you know, what one of them is the sensible heat ratio of that HVAC equipment, right? How effective is it when it is running at removing moisture? But the short answer is a smaller unit on a smaller dehumidifier on each unit is going to be the most effective because different parts of the house are used for different things. Bedrooms, usually we're in our bedrooms during the night when there's less AC runtime. And if the AC is running and you're getting up and cranking it down, it's usually not a temperature thing, it's a moisture thing. You're uncomfortable because the humidity is high. Now, that being said, if we've got bedrooms upstairs and we got a system upstairs and then we've got the main level and we've got an HVAC system, one of the strategies could be, well, our upstairs gets really warm already. And again, dehumidifiers, a byproduct is some a little bit of heat. Mm -hmm. So I might pull a dedicated return from the upstairs and put a larger dehumidifier on the main level system and tie that return to that system on the main level. So I'm not putting warm air upstairs, um, but I'm pulling from there. So I'm getting good communication throughout the house because most people don't realize that water vapor is lighter than air. So water, if you took a, 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 a relative humidity reading at the floor in a room and then at the ceiling in the room, it's usually going to be a higher relative humidity at the ceiling. So if I can pull from that upstairs at least and get, you know, dehumidify that air, then I'm going to minimize the amount that's rising. That's there's, excellent. 
lots of ways to skin a cat. I mean, right. it, but you got there's a lot of questions that usually go in, but I think that's the the simplest ways. Well, and that's that there's a lot of questions and sometimes the best answer is a few more questions. Uh, and, you know, so I, I totally understand that. So the other thing I want to talk, touch on real quick is we also get a lot of calls from clients who are talking about maybe just putting in a portable dehumidifier because they say they have uh, elevated humidity in a room. It happens a lot in bathrooms. Um, I do a lot of work with um, clients in Australia and New Zealand, and it's very common for them to put a small portable just in the bathroom. But um, is that something where doing a whole house dehumidification would then not only assist the bathroom, but actually improve the indoor air quality in general? Yeah. yeah. I So, and I, I get this a lot, you know, well, we want to pull a return from the bathroom. And, and mm -hmm. we don't recommend that. First of all, we need to have effective uh, exhaust yeah. bathroom fans, right? Mm -hmm. So, and not based on a relative humidity sensor, um, not based on someone coming in and flipping on a switch. You know, we want a timer based that's going to run for 20 to 30 minutes after somebody leaves the bathroom um, is the most effective. And then leaving the door open. It's such a small space that it, those are called, you know, wedding moments, right? I mean, it's it's a wedding situation. It shouldn't last long if we're effective at those and then having a dehumidifier that focuses on the entire house because, you know, hot goes to cold and wet goes to dry. And so as soon as you open that bathroom door, that moisture is going to start moving its its way out. And so we just want to make sure that we're effective at, um, you know, bath fans, kitchen hoods, that sort of thing. When we do have those, uh, the, those times of creating wet areas and then the the whole house dehumidifier will help focus on the entire home um, when it needs it. Excellent. I am sure after this, we're going to get a lot of people asking more questions and hopefully we get a lot of people who are interested in procuring a Santa Fe whole home dehumidification system. Should they just reach out to their local HVAC contractor? What's the best way for them to get more information or to get equipment? Sure, so um, we go through HVAC contractors. Um, we also work with a lot of crawl space basement de uh, contractors as well. On our website, um, which is www.santa-fay-products.com. At some point, somebody loved hyphens in our company. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but um, if you go on, there's a where to buy. We have, um, because we do, you know, more of the, the portable uh, freestanding, we have some uh, e-commerce partners as well. And then we have a dealer locator on there. So if you go in there and put in your zip code, um, it should pull up some contractors by you based on if you're looking at whole house or crawl space and basement. And if they're not, you know, if you have a contractor who's not on there, they, sh they have access to our products. Okay, excellent. Nikki, this has been fabulous. I've learned so much already, um, and uh, I am sure our listeners will learn as well. Um, you're you're more than welcome to come on back to the show anytime you'd like. If you have new products to share or new ideas to share, uh, we'd love to have you on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Everybody else, uh, have a good rest of your day. We'll be back again next week with another exciting episode of non-toxic environments thanks for listening and we'll talk soon bye-bye <laughs>